at the grave risk of overtiring you, now I ask you once more to look at that little uh, map of 1 Corinthians that I provided you with to notice one thing that is common to all the subsections in the book. And that is the references to the death of Christ. Where we particularly notice the technical terms that are used in connection with his death. In section 1, chapters 1, 2, 3 and 4, but particularly in chapters 1 and 2, we have reference to the cross of Christ. And it is exceedingly important that we understand what the New Testament means by the cross of Christ. You will hear some people still, as they did in my youth, you will hear some people still talking in such terms as, well, you know, I have lumbago in the back, but that is the cross I have to bear. Well, we know what they mean, or intended to say, but actually lumbago isn't anything to do with the cross of Christ, do you see? The cross of Christ is what the world gave to our Lord. He tells us that we are to take up our own cross and follow him. You will not read that he took up his cross. Passages tell us that they laid the cross on Jesus. We preach Christ crucified, says Paul. Both the power of God and the wisdom of God. All we may need notice now then is this particular and special meaning uh, when the, uh, our Lord's death is uh, referred to in terms of the cross of Christ. Then in chapter 5, we have once more reference to the death of Christ. But here it points out that Christ our Passover has been sacrificed for us. And the use of Passover as a metaphor in this passage reminds us, of course, that the Passover instituted by God in Israel was fulfilled by our Lord's death at Calvary. He says in the Gospel of Luke, we desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will no longer eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Now the original Passover was not a prophecy. It was not a prediction. It was in fact a memorial of a past event when the scripture talks of it being fulfilled in the death of Christ. It is talking in terms of a prototype that is now fulfilled at a higher level. The Passover then was a prototype. It was redemption from the wrath of God through the blood of a lamb. That established a certain principle that when our Lord died, that same principle but an infinitely higher level was fulfilled. Christ our Passover then. In the third section, and in chapter 10 in particular, the death of Christ is, uh, and the results that come therefrom are described as the table of the Lord. The term is to be found in the prophecy of Malachi at the end of the Old Testament. 
and originally referred to the altar. Called a table because of all the benefits that the sacrifice and death of Christ have brought to us. In section 4, the death of Christ is again spoken of. Only here under the caption of the Lord's Supper. As we remember the Lord in the giving of his body, this is my body which is given for you. And then the cup symbolizing his blood. This cup is the new covenant, says he, in my blood. The death of Christ establishing the new covenant. In section 5, the emphasis lies on the our Lord's baptizing his people in the Spirit. Now the term goes back to John the Baptist, who when he heralded our Lord's coming, said two things amongst others about our Lord that would distinguish him from all else. Behold, said John, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. But then he added, I knew him not, but he who sent me to baptize said unto me, On whomsoever thou shalt see the Spirit of God descending and lighting on him and remaining on him, This is he that will baptize in the Holy Spirit. And I saw and bear record that this is indeed the Son of God. The two things that according to John the Baptist distinguish our Lord. His sacrifice as the Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world. And then on the positive side, he is the one who baptizes in the Spirit of God. And finally, in chapter 15, the chapter that is all about the resurrection of Christ, but the resurrection of Christ is an integral part of the gospel. So says Paul, I make known to you the gospel and the words in which I preached it, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. That's the gospel. Oh, but it's only part of the gospel. The next bit is he was buried. I hope you're prepared to think that that is part of the gospel too. He was buried as literally we may be one of these days. And on the third day he rose again according to the scriptures. That is glorious gospel, an integral part of the gospel. And the gospel is not yet finished. And was seen. That is part of the gospel. The evidence for the resurrection. The eyewitnesses of our Lord after he was raised from the dead. So the resurrection, of course, is an integral part of the gospel message that begins with Christ died for our sins. And in Romans chapter 4, Paul reminds us of the connection between the two. Christ was delivered up for our offences, that is his death, raised again for our justification.
And of course, in that chapter 15, Christ being raised from the dead is the first fruits of those that slept. So throughout each of these major sections of the gospel, uh, of the epistle, the death of Christ is prominent. And with that we come to back to section one. And the danger was that the Corinthians were beginning to put their confidence in big men. Now it is right that we should trust the evangelists and the apostles. We have our Lord's statement of the, about the apostles, that those that accept you accept me and those that reject you reject me. You cannot reject the apostle Paul and his teaching unless you're prepared to reject Christ as well. You cannot reject the teaching of Peter in his epistle and remain friends with Christ. We are to respect the great gifts that God has given to the church and to remember that the church is built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. But that said, what they were doing in Corinth was uh, nefarious. They were forming cliques around some big man and then talking of themselves as being of apostles, of, of, of Apollos or of Paul or of Peter, thus distinguishing themselves one from another so that the ones that were of Paul <laughs> looked down a little bit and were in competition with those that said they were of Peter or Apollo. With the beginnings and the potentials of division amongst the people of God. It has been a sad thing down through history that we have copied them. I once was invited in this city to a drawing room meeting by the leaders of a certain denomination which shall remain nameless. They were going to have a year of evangelism, they told me, and uh, they were getting various speakers along to prepare them for this year of evangelism. And I was flattered by their invitation of me, do you see? But just a little bit naughty, do you see, and provocative. I suggested that uh, by way of preparing for evangelism, we should make sure we don't undercut the evangelists. And I expounded what I meant by undercutting the evangelists by advertising to the world our differences. We're Christians, but please don't mistake us with them down the road. Why do we do it? I made the observation to them that if a man from Mars, if there be men on Mars, came down to Earth and to Belfast and looked round the church notice boards, the last name he'd see on them would be Christ. There's every other title you can imagine. Why do we do it? Why do we emphasise the differences? Why can't we just be plain Christian. But this tendency to be attracted to big men and ultimately to put our faith in them instead of in God, 
leads to weakness. God protested with a vivid object lesson of it in Old Testament days. The story of David and Goliath stands in the first book of Samuel as God protest against the people of God putting their faith in big men. The context of that famous story of David and Goliath is as follows. There were times when Israel were ruled by judges, but the judges, alas, became corrupt and went downhill. And though Samuel himself was a very good man and upright and uh, without blame as a judge, his sons were no good. So the people came to Samuel and said, now look here, we're tired of all this, please make us a king. A monarch, that is. One of their motivations, as Samuel later told them, was as follows. That when, as a nation, they had gone astray, or as tribes they had gone astray, God had allowed them to be overcome by their enemies. And when they uh, suffered under their enemies, eventually they would cry to the Lord and the Lord would raise up a deliverer, do you see, and deliver them from their enemy. And he would judge them and bring them back to God's uh, 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 commandments uh, and to obedience to them. But says Samuel, when you saw the Ammonites coming against you, you sort of lost your nerve, didn't you? Uh, well, you see, uh, if you've got an enemy like an Ammonite coming at you, it's a bit nerve-wracking, isn't it, have to kneel down and have a prayer meeting and pray God to raise up a deliverer for you. If only you could have a king, then he would be installed ready, wouldn't he, do you see, to act. And that was their idea. Now, Samuel was put out by this uh, 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 request, but God said, all right, it's not you that they've rejected, it's me they've rejected, Samuel, do you see? So make him a king, yes. And so God uh, chose a king, and he had uh, Saul anointed by Samuel. And when Samuel presented Saul to the people as their new king, well, the people were enraptured because, you see, he was head and shoulders above. Oh, he was some man, some big man. They clapped their hands and said, thank you, God, you've done us really fine. A big man to fight our battles. They thought God was very good. And I'd be truthful, uh, this big man Saul, he did accomplish uh, quite a lot of things like big men will do. He smote Ammonites, for instance, and so forth. It wasn't much good against Philistines, but never mind. Uh -huh. Well, one day, when it was a war with the Philistines, they came out of the camp of the Philistines, absolute mountain of a man. His name was Goliath. And that's the trouble, you know, with putting your trust in big men. You're all right so long as a bigger man doesn't come on the, on the arena. And here was this mighty great chap, Goliath. And even Saul skulked in his tent, afraid to go out to meet him. Then God taught them a lesson, did he not? And David asked permission from Saul to go out to meet the giant. And Saul said, well, if you must go, here's my armour. David tried it on, but it didn't fit. And would have been a stupid thing anyway. You take Saul's sword or spear and go out against Goliath. He had a spear the length of a telegraph pole. And he, David wouldn't have got anywhere near him. David eventually went out with nothing 
but a staff, stick, a sling and five stones. When Goliath saw him coming, he felt insulted, of course. You'll come against me with a stick, like a man drives a dog out of his backyard. Do you see? Goliath was a man of war, a hero, experienced in many battles, and to be presented with a youth like David with a stick was an insult to, to Goliath. It's like putting me in a ring with a world champion boxer. He wouldn't bother to fight me. I'd feel insulted. So Goliath denounced David. And when it came David's turn to reply to Goliath, he made the point clear. It's not armour that's going to decide it, Saul. I come to you in the name of God whose armies you have defied. It was David's faith in God as he stood there armourless apart from a stick and a sling that now God would intervene, which God did. So the ridiculously weak weapons David chose were chosen to illustrate the point that his faith was in God. And Israel, in putting their faith in a big man rather than in God, was misplaced. And in 1 Corinthians and chapter 1, Paul uses these very terms, doesn't he? To say, First of all, in the technique used for seeing that in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom knew not God. It was God's good pleasure through the foolishness of the thing preached, the message preached, to save them that believe. Seeing that the Jews ask for signs and the Greeks seek after wisdom, that we preach Christ crucified unto Jews a stumbling block, and unto Gentiles foolishness. But are them that are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. So that much of God's technique of his weapons, using what to the world is folly and weakness, but also in God's choice. Verse 26, For behold your calling, brethren, how that not many wise after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God chose the foolish things of the world, that he might bring to shame them that are wise, and God chose the weak things of the world, that he might put to shame the things that are mighty. And the base things of the world and things that God despised did God choose, yea, and the things that are not, that he might bring to naught the things that are, that no flesh should glory before God. It's not only in the means and the techniques of Christ crucified, but in God's election of those that are saved. Now, some people will say that God's election is utterly unconditional. But this passage tells us the very opposite. God has laid it down. God has a right to do, you know. God's a right to dictate the terms of salvation. And God has dictated them. The weak the foolish. The powerless. The things that are not. You have your choice, lady and gentlemen. You have your choice. Do you like to be those that confess themselves weak and helpless? 
God's salvation is for you. To try to come to God on the ground that you are strong and wise, he will pass you by. Because what is at stake is what is our basic need, the reality of the situation. Our trouble has been caused by lack of faith in God and his word. The fall in the Garden of Eden happened not when Adam began to abuse Eve or maltreat her. It happened when Satan succeeded in convincing them that God's word was not to be trusted. That they needn't depend on God. that they could be successful in independence of God and his word. That is disastrous for man and accounts for God's use of the cross of Christ. The trouble is not our lack of, whiz, uh, of brains. It lies in our hearts. The cross of Christ is man crossed out. The offence of the cross for us believers sometimes is lost because we look back on Calvary with love and gratitude in our hearts because our Saviour died there at a place called Calvary, runs the phrase. But we seem to have forgotten sometimes what Calvary means. It's the Latin translation of Golgotha, which means the place of a skull. There Jesus was put to death. Indicating the ruination of man trusting his own wisdom. So they foolish man in his own wisdom put God's son to a cross at the place of a skull. You will remember the offence it gave to Saul of Tarsus. How difficult he found it brought up a Jew, met, doing his best and, and amazingly uh, achieving a great deal in keeping the law. There were two things he found difficult about Christians. One, they claimed that Jesus was God. That seemed to him to conflict with monotheism and conflict with the basic proposition, the Lord, your God is one Lord. But the second infuriating thing, that they said Jesus was the Messiah, the Jesus who hung upon a cross, on a tree. Well, in the Old Testament, if a man were condemned to death for some hideous crime, exceptionally bad, when he was executed, generally by stoning, then he was hung upon a tree, but only till nightfall and then taken down. For cursed of God is he that hangs on a tree. In that situation. And here were the Christians saying that this Jesus who was hung upon a tree and cursed of God was the Messiah, It seemed to me him to be infamous blasphemy. 
until, of course, the risen Lord appeared to him on the Damascus Road. The blinding light from heaven, which Paul recognised at once surely to be the Shekinah glory, had him to the ground. And uh, he said, Who art thou, Lord? Curios. Now you should remember that Jews of that time, and still to this day, will never pronounce the name Yahweh. Whatever it occurs, even in Scripture, they will read instead Adonai, which means Lord. So much so that when the Greek translators, the Jewish translators of the Old Testament into Greek, called the Septuagint, came across the name Yahweh in the Hebrew, they simply translated it by the Greek word kurios, which means Lord. And when Paul said, Who art thou, Lord? Well, he didn't need to be told that the, this was the Shekinah glory. And the voice came back, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It was subsequent to it that Paul realised why Jesus Christ, God's Son and Messiah, was hung upon a cross. Cursed of God. That Paul, Saul of Tarsus, with all his efforts to keep the law, had failed to keep it perfectly and deserved the curse of the Old Testament. Cursed is every one that continueth not in all the points of the law, to do them. And that Jesus Christ was his saviour, because Christ bore that curse for him. That is what the cross still means. If there's no salvation apart from the cross of Christ, it is because, viewed from the point of view of God's holiness, all our brain power, all our moral power, all our physical power has come short and we deserve God's curse. That is the cross. And Christ bore it for us. That is an end of man's, in that wrong sense, trust in man, or in big men for that matter. And Paul, the great apostle, will tell the believers that I was crucified with Christ, he says. I to the law, I to the, I, uh, 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 by the law, died to the law. That is, the law condemned me. And when Christ died, I died. And when Christ rose, he gave me new life. The cross of Christ. It's important that we understand what the basic term means. Of course, says Paul, I speak a wisdom among those that are perfect, but not the wisdom of this world. He's now gone on to chapter 2 of his first letter. Verse 6 onwards. We speak God's wisdom in a mystery, even the wisdom that hath been hidden, which God foreordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the rulers of this world know, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But in spite of all their pretension to wisdom, they didn't know this marvellous fact. They were utter ignoramuses. They crucified the Lord of glory. 
But as it is written, things which I saw not, and ear heard not, and which entered not into the heart of man, whatsoever the things God prepared for them that love him. And there so many stop, don't they? Because they think that verse 9 is his description of heaven, the things that have never been seen and we shan't see until we get home to heaven. But that's not so. Verse 10 says, But unto us God has revealed them through the Spirit, and the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For who among men knoweth the things of a man, save the Spirit of the man which is in him? Even so the things of God none knows, save the Spirit of God. But we receive not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Mark the analogy. Who, knoweth, who among men knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of a man? That is true. There are certain things we share with animals. I'm not insulting you. But uh, if you should have a dog, and the dog sees you eating a beef steak, the, God, the dog has some idea of the experience you're having. All that delightful tickling of the palate, and as the thing goes down into the stomach, or the feeling of satisfaction and enjoyment, particularly if it's well cooked, it will say, the dog understands that. He's got a stomach that works very much like your stomach, you see. But should you take them into your library and show him a, a, a picture by Rembrandt? No, the dog is at a loss. He hasn't got the, the wherewithal to understand it, you know. All he can do is to lick the thing. No, it doesn't give much. Or smell it. Do you say, no, it doesn't yield much. He can't make out what you're looking at, you see. He would need a human spirit to understand it. And the things of God, uh, uh, the man of the world doesn't know. I remember the schoolmaster that taught me Greek. And we used to, in the sixth form, uh, study old Plato and his dialogues and uh, Platonic philosophy and things of that order. And he said to me, knowing I was a Christian, of course, he said, well, Plato, I can understand, but I take my, heart, I, uh, my hat off to Paul. He says, I can't make head and tail of him. Nor could he. How would you expect it? To understand what Paul is saying in that sense, you'll need the Spirit of God. That is where faith in big men can lead us astray. Because if we come expectant from big men, it could divert our attention from the Spirit of God. It is as we depend on the Spirit of God who uses men, sometimes big men indeed. I have nothing against big men. But it is our dependence on the Spirit of God to reveal to us the things of God that is decisively important. And there could be a slight danger, couldn't there, in Christian folks who are prepared to come to church if there's a big speaker. Instead of coming to church to wait on God. And so they go around preacher tasting. Instead of coming to wait on God. And says Paul to the Corinthians, your division like this, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Cephas, will lead you, spirit, leave you spiritual babies. <laughs> 
Hence then, man in relation to God. Let not the rich man put his confidence in riches or think his significance lies in them or the wise man in his wisdom or the mighty man in his strength. What is your significance? Allow me, lady and gentlemen, to allow me to tell you what your significance is. Your real significance. <laughs> that you were made by God. You are his handiwork. And through Christ you know God. Not the highest archangel in glory with all his powers can say more than that. And you can say more than the archangel because that God gave his son for you. That is your significance. And in that, you should put your confidence. When he comes to chapters 5 to 7, Paul is now going to use another metaphor for the sacrifice of Christ. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. The context is, of course, the immediate context, is this outrageous example of immorality and permissiveness that the church in Corinth had allowed. In fact, some of them, instead of being contrite about it, were puffed up as though it were an example of their wonderful breadth of mind, not narrow-minded as Christians, you see. This man had his father's wife. And as I said earlier, Greeks <laughs> were permissive, enormously permissive. As you will see from the New Testament, Paul needs to tell Christians at Corinth that fornication is wrong. Greeks would never have dreamed of it. And I gather from some pastors and preachers that we need to say it again nowadays because our modern people are losing an idea that fornication is wrong. And the church at large, is prepared to ordain homosexual bishops as though it were a sign of broad-mindedness and Christian liberty. This was the kind of situation in Corinth. Though first-generation Christians in a city like that had more excuse than we have in our day, He calls upon them to exercise firm church discipline. And down the centuries, the church has felt free not to exercise church discipline. And people like St. Augustine have appealed to Scripture as a reason why they shouldn't exercise church discipline. Augustine famously quoted the parable of the wheat and the tares from Matthew 13 and said that the field represents the church and Christ has planted good seed and genuine believers but then there are tares and when the servants of the king whose land it was asked him was it his will that they should uproot the tares the owner said, no, lest uprooting the tares, you uproot the good uh, wheat as well, to say. So Augustine laid it down, that it is not for us in the church 
to decide who are uh, true believers or not true believers, we uh, must accept everybody and not have church discipline. Our good, wonderful reformer, Luther, originally held that there should be godly church discipline. Not perfectionism, but that God lays certain standards down and if they are transgressed unrepentantly, then there should be church discipline. The next communication, if need be. But Luther was supported by the German princes, owed his life to them. And some of them were immoral men. How could you excommunicate them from the church? So he didn't. The interpretation of the parable of the wheat and tares by Augustine was mistaken, wasn't it? For our Lord interprets it, the field is not the church, but it is the world in which world well, God has planted the good seed, which has resulted in believers, in which the devil has planted bad seed. The parable and the, uh, with its exhortation to the workers that not to, um, at the moment, uproot the tares, but to wait till harvest. The servants, when they are interpreted by Christ, are not the elders of the church, you know. It's not given to the elders of the church to gather the wicked into bundles and to put them in the lake of fire, massively. <laughs> they are the angels that are commanded to do it. Discipline in the church is an altogether different thing. Says Paul, I don't judge them that are without. That's not my business as Christians. And if somebody invites you to a dinner and you know he's a, a homosexual or whatever and this, that and t'other and you have reasons for going, well, you may go. A different thing if a man who professes to be a Christian commits outrageous things like this. Is that narrow-mindedness on Paul's part? No. Because he countenanced the possibility that this discipline by the church could lead to the man's spirit being saved in the day of the Lord. If he is not conscious in his, in his conscience that what he's done is fearfully wrong and contrary to Christ and everything else, then perhaps the discipline will wake him up. And he come to repentance and actually be saved in the day of the Lord. But in any case, Paul cites now the death of Christ under uh, the analogy and the metaphor, Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Doubtless the people in Corinth that were puffed up over this incident would have campaigned for their freedom. Are we not free? And now Paul gives the answer to that kind of comment. No, you're not free. For when the lamb of the Passover was killed, sacrificed, the conditions for taking part in the Passover lamb were that they should keep the feast of unleavened bread. <laughs> 
if you weren't prepared for the Feast of Unleavened Bread, you couldn't enjoy the Passover. Christ our Passover has been sacrificed for us, been offered for us. Let us therefore keep the feast. Purge out the old leaven, for a little leaven leavens the whole lump. That is true of morality. That is true of doctrine, as Paul elsewhere makes clear. Who, we who benefit from the Passover Lamb of God are obliged to keep the Feast of Unleavened Bread in its significance. The Jews to this day keep it regularly, don't they? Before Passover time, Father will go through the house and Mother is responsible for getting all the leaven out of it. Dad will hide a bit of leaven in some obscure cupboard. And then he will conduct the children round when the day comes to see if they can find any leaven. And they don't find it here, and they don't find it there, and they don't find it somewhere else. And at last, to the children's great delight, they find it in this obscure cupboard. And of course, it's taken out and ceremonially burned. God give us the grace to do similarly. But let us remind ourselves of the Passover. They scarce had got outside the confines of Egypt when in Exodus 13, the chapter that follows the directions for the Passover, God announces that from now on, he claims the firstborn in every family as his. Why was that? Well, because the night that the angel, the destroying angel, passed through Egypt, it executed the firstborn in every family. Except those families who had taken the blood of the Passover lamb and put it on the lintel and and on the, th uh, on the uh, threshold and so forth. And God had said, when I see the blood, I will stretch myself over the door so that the destroying angel won't come through to you. So the firstborn in that house lived on solely because the Passover lamb died in his stead. And therefore, from now on, says God, on that ground, I claim the firstborn as mine. Subsequently, God substituted the Levites for the firstborn. But that is beside our immediate point. We're not free. Says Paul, as he comes to the end of this section in chapter 6, Know you not that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit which is in you, which you have from God, and you are not your own. For you were bought with a price. Glorify God therefore in your body. In that sense we are not free. There's another sense in which God Christ has given us marvellous freedom. But in this sense we're not free. If we are redeemed, we are not our own. We've been bought with a price. Christ has died for us. We live because he died. We're not our own. We're bought with a price. And there is one more thing about the Passover that could be illuminating and instructive for us. Do you know why they originally they didn't uh, have leaven in the bread? It was because they went out in haste, you know. <laughs> Hadn't got time for leaven to work. If you had to make the bread every day, more or less, 
They hadn't got the time to, for the leaven to work, so they had to eat unleavened bread because they came out, says the Old Testament, in haste. There wasn't the time for it. And when Paul comes to this particular section and he's discussing the pros and cons of marriage and this and that and the other, he eventually comes round to the observation, my brothers, he said, the time is short. You haven't got time for everything, you know. Not in this life. Each of us has his gift from God. The gift to get married is from God. The gift to remain single is from God. Each is a charisma. So when my charismatic friends tell me I, I'm not charismatic, I say I am. Because I have a charisma. I have a charisma for remaining a bachelor. And I have a charisma, other people will tell me what it is, in the body of Christ, you see. So I'm charismatic. How not, do you see? But I stand remembering from time to time that the time is short, you know. We haven't got time to do everything. Time, therefore, we are not our own. We must consider the best use of the short time. Here is a couple, huh? man and wife, and they're going on holiday, and they're going indeed on a tour of the world, care of British Airways. And they've got to Heathrow. And it's early morning, you see. And the man says, I, I must have my breakfast. Do you see? So the wife says, well, just take a cup of coffee because the plane is now going in a few minutes. No, he says, I always have bacon and sausage, you know, my dear. I always have bacon and sausage for breakfast. I'm going to have bacon and sausage. Yeah, uh, yes, I know. Yes, but you see, the time is short. We haven't got time to go into the cafe and get the bacon and sausage. Else we shall miss the plane. I don't care, says he. I'm going to have my bacon and sausage. Oh. So they miss the plane and the cruise around the world. The time is short, my brothers and sisters. We haven't time for everything. And since we're not our own, but have been bought with a price, that side of the unleavened bread must weigh with us from time to time. How can I use the short time to the maximum glory of Christ and God? So let's leave it there for the time being.